Well, thanks very much, Charlotte, for uh, being our host for tonight. As the president of the uh, this afternoon, as the president of the ANU Labor Students Club, uh, can I acknowledge first we're meeting on the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal people and pay my respects to their elders, uh, past and present. Uh, and thank you all for uh, for being here on uh, on short notice today to hear Bill. One of the sort of standard tropes you hear trotted out in, in every election campaign is that really there's no difference between the parties that it's like the People's Popular Front of Judea versus the Popular People's <coughs> Front of Judea. But elections, they do change history. And one way of thinking about that is to think about the kind of Australia we would have if John Howard had just remained in office for the next two terms. We wouldn't have disability care. We probably wouldn't have a seat on the UN Security Council. We probably wouldn't have apologised to the stolen generations tripled Australia's marine park net network and raised universal superannuation. And we'd have a smaller economy. Unemployment would be higher and we'd still be recovering from the recession of 2009. <coughs> and there's no issue that illustrates the differences between the party better than the issue of parental leave. Labor introduced Australia's first system of parental leave, one that's benefited over 300,000 families. One that gives the same amount to all Australian families. But the Coalition, well, they don't believe in equal treatment. When they see a kid with a silver spoon in his mouth, they think what that kid really needs is a gold spoon to go with it. And by the way, here's a plastic spoon for the kid down the road and the working class side of it. And I'm, uh, I'm old enough to remember last year when Joe Hockey was lecturing us about the end of the age of entitlement. And now when coalition MPs are pressed as to why they're providing more to the rich, they say it's because it's not welfare, it's entitlement. It's sort of like a little window into their thinking. If you're giving a leg up to a minimum wage worker of wealth, that must be welfare. But if you're giving $75,000 to an affluent family, that couldn't possibly be welfare. It must be their entitlement. And so, to our speaker for today. In 1940, George Orwell wrote an essay about Charles Dickens, in which he says that for all the discussions of working life that you get in Dickens' novels, like Great Expectations or A Tale of Two Cities, Dickens never really seemed to regard slum dwellers, servants, criminals, agricultural labourers as equals. In another essay, Orwell makes the same criticism of Tolstoy. Tolstoy is fascinated intellectually with the problems of poverty, but he doesn't really seem to want to break bread with the poor. And I used to think this matters very much, but now I really do. There's a story that uh, from 1996 to 2007, when a Christmas party took place in the PM suite, the cleaners weren't invited. And the first time the cleaners were invited to the PM's Christmas party it was Christmas 2007. And I see that same sort of spirit with Bill here in my electorate. I've seen him sit down with people with disabilities and just openly ask them, so what do you call it, the, the condition that you've got? And just break into a normal, comfortable conversation. I've seen him stand on a building site with a group of building workers at 7.30 in the morning and talk to them about the incidence of the corporate income tax. And say to me afterwards, Andrew, the key about politics, you never dumb down your message. I've been with him in a kitchen where we were taken in and introduced to the cooks. It was Bill who immediately stepped over to introduce himself to the guy washing the dishes. Bill's been at the centre of many of the government's big reforms. He's thoughtful, he's articulate, he's funny. But what's really important to know about Bill is that for him, progressive reform isn't just about passing laws, it's also about helping people, about reaching out, about hearing their stories, and about acting on their stories. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Bill Shaw. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Andrew, for that generous welcome. <coughs> I'm pleased that uh, Andrew's asked me to deliver this lecture today here, the Fraser Lecture 2013. 
Andrew is actually very modest because he too is a man of big ideas and he's willing to advance these arguments persuasively from the public gaze. He is what I would describe as a combatant for Labor in the battlefield for ideas about the future of this country. Last Friday I had the honour to share the stage with another big ideas man, one of the giants of the Australian Labor Party, Paul Keating. That was at the launch of my own campaign in Maribel. He was in vintage form, Paul Keating. He was incisive, he was sharp, he was smart. He reminded us the label was on the side of the angels. The angels he described as the men and women of Australia who make the place what it is. The ones who've got nothing to sell with their labour, nothing to sell with their time, no capital, particularly, and who need the support of the political system to give them a better standard of living, a better way of life, and a better future. How right Paul Keating is. Ask yourself, who has made the reforms and investments necessary that ensure that the political system gives men and women of Australia a better standard of living, a better way of life, a better future, and in doing so open the Australian economy? As Keating remarked on Friday night, Australians, since Labor was elected in the 80s, have moved up from the Commodore to the Audi. And we're the ones who help them do this, the Australian Labor Party. We do this because we are ambitious for our fellow Australians. We are dreamers, we're doers, and we're fighters. We have ideas, but we just don't want to talk about them. We're prepared to fight and argue and move inch by inch to make our dreams and our ideas the reality they should be. That's what we do. We don't slavishly follow an Australian Labor the fashions of politics automatically from overseas. This is why I believe Australia avoided some of the excesses of Thatcherism, of Reaganism. Because here in this room we know that ideas are powerful. But in the wrong hands, these ideas can be very dangerous. I'd like to quote from perhaps not the usual source for a Labor lecture, Sir Keith Joseph. He was the so-called power behind Margaret Thatcher's throne when he addressed the 1976 British Tory conference, he said, scorn not the vision, scorn not the idea. Power grows out of the barrel of the gun. The gun is certainly powerful. For who controls the man with the gun? The man with the idea. When he said those memorable words, he was mocked, not the least of which from within the ranks of his own party but he enjoyed the last laugh. Thatcherism took the free market theories of Hayek and Friedman from the margins to the mainstream. Now I'm not anti-market by any stretch of the imagination whatsoever. I would consider myself to be pro-market, pro-competition, pro-innovation. But I just don't think that the economy has to be at the expense of the society. On the contrary, I believe that both are linked. But you can't have a truly functioning, strong economy without a strong society. <coughs> you should make no mistake that we're at a crossroad. Once again, there are some on the conservative side of politics and the media who tell us that we must make a choice. Do we have to prioritise the economy or the society, but you can't have both. I'd submit today that the correct answer is not either or, but it's actually both. That's why, and if we don't want to see the Australian way of life at risk of the sort of social immobility of the United States or the UK, Labor has to always continue to prevail in the battle of ideas. We know that our future's on the line. So today, I'd like to talk about four fronts in this battle of ideas. The first I'd like to talk about is that why ideas are so important in Australian democracy. Secondly, I'd like to talk about why our ideas are so central to the labour movement that most of us here would support. And indeed, why our ideas are more often than not superior to those of our opponents. 
Thirdly, I would like to put to you why this Labor Party, this Australian Labor Party was put on this earth. It's to create and maintain a good society. And finally, I want you to know that this Labor government has been doing much in the battle of ideas. We need to be clear about our Labor ideas in this election. We need to be clear that our ideas always have a vision, that we in Labor always have a vision that we have an open horizons purpose, which is, I would submit, to build a good society. Now we know rather, famous, rather famously, Margaret Thatcher said, that there is no such thing as society. I'm sure that many of her conservative Australian disciples still feel the same. Labor feels differently, it always has, and it always will. Now we've pursued reforms to open up the market and make it work more effective. We've led the way. We did float the dollar with, to financial deregulation. We've opened up our markets. But unlike the Conservatives elsewhere, we've been able to make these reforms of an open economy, a competitive economy, an innovative economy, a profitable economy, without it being at the expense of a great number of jobs and without it being at the expense of ordinary people. Hawke worked with Bill Kelty and the Labor movement, and the unions, to build a consensus around the Labor government's policies. Kevin Rudd has reignited this with the discussions with the BCA and the ACTU. Labor introduced a social wage. You know the social wage, we take it for granted. In the fine print of the Australian safety net, it's written, Labor made. Medicare, superannuation, expanded higher education, tax cuts. Labor invented what Bill Clinton and Tony Blair were later to call him Christen the Third Way. A senior eminent Australian economist, Tim Harcourt, has recently argued the third way is really the Australian way. And our Australian way works. We have one of, if not the best performing economies in the OECD. We've had no recession for the last 22 years despite even the most recent global financial crisis, which is really in most other nations, it's not called a global financial crisis, it's called a global financial recession. Look at the unemployment rate in the United Kingdom, 7.8%. Ours has just edged up to 5.7%. In the United States, it's been stuck at above 8% for most of the last five years. In Spain, it's 26%. Their youth unemployment's 50%. Yet look at us, 203 nations in the world, only eight have a AAA rating. One of them is us. Interest rates are at record lows. A family on a mortgage of $300,000 are now paying $6,000 a year less in mortgage repayments than they would have before Labor was elected. And inflation is exactly where we want it. The other night, Paul Keating reminded people of one of the enduring legacies of a Labor government. He reminded how much real wages have improved since 1991. They've gone up 36% at a time when they've either stagnated or gone backwards in many other developing economies, including, but alluded to the United Kingdom and the United States. We've had bigger profits, we've got improved productivity. Things are okay in this country. Who's made that possible? I would submit to you today that it's Labor's Australian way, Labor's enduring Australian way. It's not about luck. It's about having good ideas and better ideas and backing people in. You know, from day one in 1891, the Australian Labor Party has been a movement of ideas. Simple but important ideas which endure. Like our belief in a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. And of course, the bigger, sweeping nation building ideas. The National Broadband Network, lifting superannuation from 9 to 12 per cent, funding our schools according to need, and funding them more generously than ever before, and of course the National Disability Insurance Gap. Simple but great ideas, such as Gough Whitlam reforming the Family Law Act, bringing the troops home, recognising China, supporting higher education. Simple but good ideas, like the plan for peacetime reconstruction in Australia led by John Curtin and Ben Shipley. 
Andrew Fisher, one of Australia's earliest and greatest Prime Ministers. He built Transcontinental Railway. Friends, if you look at 122 years, the case is clear that Labor are the dreamers, the doers, and we are the fighters. There was a humble Rockhampton bookseller, William Kidston, <clears throat> not necessarily the best known of people in the pantheon of Labor heroes, but he was actually the world's first Labor treasurer. Queensland, he summed up our creed. In 1891, he wrote a poem for the striking shearers gathered under the tree of knowledge in Buckalden. He actually urged them to shun extremism and instead embrace ballot box justice. The title of his poem consisted of five simple words. The ballot is the thing. Five simple words, one magnificent idea. Claim your democratic rights. Form a Labor Party. Win government. Make Australia a better place. Make Australia a good society. Just eight years later, <coughs> Queensland Labor stunned the world by forming the world's first Labor government. It only lasted a week, <coughs> but it whetted the appetite of our predecessors. Five years on, Chris Watson formed the world's first national Labor government, albeit a minority one. In 1910, Andy Fisher formed the world's first Labor government in its own right. Then as now, that year's federal election, just as it is now, is not simply the pursuit of power because we believe it's our turn, much as the Conservatives always believe it's their turn. William Spence, who indeed was once the National Secretary of the Australian Workers' Union, and he was a Labor MP, boasted at that time, the Labor movement in Australia has now become an almost dominant factor in the political life of our community. He argued that this coming triumph entailed more than just the churning of vote-winning policies. Spence insisted that Labor was a political as well as a propagandist movement. In other words, Labor had to have the better ideas and be able to better communicate them to the voters. Labor must not aspire to be a party that merely seeks to reflect public opinion. Voters need to believe in our ideas. It was ever thus, and it remains so. This belief certainly informs my view about what good Labor government should do. I can think of three great passions in my life. The first is my absolute conviction my absolute conviction that we are all born equal and individual and unique. Put another way, there is something special in every one of us. Some people might call it a soul, but I would certainly at the very least hesitate to call it that we're all born equal and something special in each of us. Our individual humanity Everyone's individual humanity, every Australian's individual humanity, doesn't matter their background, their gender, where they were born, what language they first spoke. Every individual in Australia deserves to have opportunity regardless of their background. Then my second passion is my family. The gift that one's family gives you is it reminds you that you need to not think about the next 24 hours, but you need to think with forensic passion about the well-being of the ones that you love. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years hence. It's that generational DNA that your parents' main goal in life is to make sure that you have a little more or do a little better than they did, with the expectation that when it comes your turn, you will pass on that same promise to the next generation who are dependent upon you. My other cause is the Australian Labor Party. Like some of you, I joined it at a very early age. It would be the single longest continuous thing that I've ever done. It is partly because of my family's DNA. We get a lot of our politics from our families, don't we? 
My dad was a seafarer from the northeast of England. He's had unionism and dockside life coursing through his veins forever. Mum was born here. She was uh, the eldest daughter of a family which didn't have a lot of money. Grandpa was a printer and an active trade unionist. My mother's a free thinker who's had an, an enviable and amazing career as a teacher in schools, a winner of the Supreme Court Prize for law, and always maintaining a healthy scepticism. So I, if you have that background, joining Labor is more than just an intellectual decision. It's an emotional decision. But my decision also to join the Labor Party does come from the head, because Labor is and remains the party of ideas in Australia. From an early age, you know if you support Labor, that elections are not just about power or who gets what. They're certainly not about defending privilege or resisting change so that the many may enjoy some of what the few have. But it's about which side of politics has the ideas to help Australians confront the change which is an inevitable part of the cycle of our lives. It's about which party has the best ideas to address the problems that Australia are not just confronting now, but in that 10, and 20, and 30 years and beyond horizons. I found when I was at secondary school that I was seduced by this idea that Hawke and Keating and Kelvin and others put forward, that this country works best when we are bringing people together, consensus, compromise, promoting change, recognising the legitimate interests of business, the legitimate interests of employers, the legitimate interests of welfare, but bringing them together, because this nation works best when we work as one. It is a very persuasive idea that all people should have a fair go at work, a fair share, a better future. That's the ambition which I know animates Andrew Lee, which animates me. How do we make sure that Australians can get ahead in life? We are ambitious, not just for some. We are ambitious for our nation, all of those who are Australians. But what we also recognise is that it doesn't matter who you are in life, be you the mighty or the not so mighty, none of us get to where we get on our own. That all of us have received the support of others <coughs> to get what we do obtain. And that is the case because we all need support. We need strong families and strong communities to support us not only in the good times, but in the difficult times. See, our opponents, the Conservatives, cannot beat this logic. For them, it's all about the individual. For us, it's all about the individual and the community. See, only Labor can do both. Only Labor can do this. We believe, we understand individual aspiration, but we have to do so with the knowledge that we're all in this together in our lives. There's an influential British Labour thinker called uh, Morris Glasman. He recently said of the British Labour Party, our tradition is our future. And there can be no quality without equality. For me though, my favourite dictum is the Jesuit motto of St Ignatius of Loyola, where they said, be a man for others. He was a man of his time, so he should have said, be a man or a woman for others. But it's an ideal which I've sought to live up to. See, I think that these points go to why the Labor Party has an enduring mission, why we were put on this planet to do what we do. I would submit to you that the Rudd and Gillard governments <coughs> have kept faith with this mission in the last nearly six years. They've been about pursuing and building a good society, the reason why I think all of us are enthused by Labor. It's the reason why many of us get into politics, I would submit, not just myself. It is to leave the place better <coughs> than we found it. We're all just passing through. But the best thing we can do, be it for our families, for our communities, for our jobs, for our society, is to leave the place better than we found it. Just as those before us have done that for us, and just as those who come after us will do, but would expect us and our turn to do it too. I use this term of good society. Good society, I think, does sum up a lot of what we feel about what's best about Labor and this nation. 
A good society is prosperous, productive, innovative, competitive society. It's an economy where men and women have good jobs, with regular hours of work, with control over their work, with safe jobs. It's one where they're well remunerated. So that they can educate their kids, pay their taxes, build their communities, run their sporting groups, participate in their passions and interests outside of work. Labor stands for a good society where Australians have lives full of quality and of meaning throughout their whole long life and enjoy good health. We need to make sure that wellbeing and resilience are central features of our community. We need to have an economy where entrepreneurs and innovators and small business people can turn their dreams and ideas into successful enterprises. A good society means that people do not work hard their whole life and then retire poor. Do not suffer that indignity. Do not suffer their last number of decades in a lesser condition than when they were working. A good society would believe in mutuality of effort at work, cooperative relationships at work, the seeking and the pursuit of harmony of work, so we can create a competitive, dynamic, Asia-focused 21st century. A good society would see housing being affordable, whether the people are buying their own houses or indeed are renting their own properties, renting properties. A good society means that we in Australia should be ambitious to have the best healthcare system in the world, the best healthcare system in the world, regardless of an individual's wealth. And of course, a good society must look after those in need, those who are disempowered, be they Indigenous Australians, pensioners, people experiencing unemployment, people with disabilities and their carers who are locked out of Australian life. A good society must, as a prerequisite, have the equal treatment of women throughout society. It has to revere the role of education and the special role of teachers. We should have multicultural and tolerant communities, safe places sustained by respectful relationships where people can live in their communities with an absence of fear. They should be well served by transport and infrastructure. A clean environment so that one day our children can dream of creating their own good society with an even better environment. And certainly not be required to remedy the problems that their parents failed to deal with and neglected when they were in charge. Now we understand that government cannot possibly ensure that bad things never happen to people. The poet Robert Frost Called the, called the ups and called the downs of life, the shafts of fate. They do occur. What we can do, though, is make sure that people are not on their own and that they have resilience and they have communities which don't leave people isolated to deal with Robert Frost's shafts of fate. Good society is there to make sure that we're all empowered to lead lives with meaning. But just because you're old or just because you don't speak English well, just because you don't have enough money in a bank account does not mean that you are not empowered to have a meaningful life. Our cause, the Labor cause, has been part of building this good society in Australia for 122 years. And the mission is never finished. We always need to be putting ideas into action. There is a clear case to be made for the re-election of a Labor government on September the 7th this year. Let's look at education. Labor legislated for better schools, introduced by Julia Gillard and Peter Garrett, followed through by Kevin Rudd currently. These are the most far-reaching education reforms in decades. It's based on a simple idea. We who are Labor believe in the transformative power of education. Education has always been the door through which personal and national progress occurs. For Australia to take advantage of the greatest rush we've had since the gold rush, that being the Asian century, education is at our core. Whether or not we are the TAFE of Asia or the Oxbridge of Asia, the opportunity is there waiting for us to walk through that door. We understand that education means that young people will have a better job and they will earn more money. We understand that education should be based on the principle of needs and nothing else. Needs and nothing else 
should allocate resources in education. We understand the impact of the hourly wage going up 11% is the difference between finishing year 11 and year 12. We understand that when you look at the participation rates enjoyed by people who complete year 12, earnings are 30% greater than those who do not. It's not just the profound individual benefits at work here. A highly educated workforce is so much more productive. The Liberals keep getting out the microscope to look at the Fair Work Act to make it more difficult for people to be represented by unions. Yet they would oppose guaranteeing funding for six years for schools, which will have a far greater impact than any amount of right-wing tinkering on particular sections of the Fair Work Act on productivity. But we also understand that the completion and the attainment of higher levels of education by children make them more likely to be more fully engaged in our society, to live longer and be healthier. Education is about discovery. It's about friendship. It's about excitement. It's about pleasure. It's about falling in love with passions which will carry your adult life and fulfil that meaning which is within us all. Education teaches us how to live together, how to work together for a better future. It is, in short, the engine room of building a good society. Consider, beyond education, the second argument in the case for labour. It would be the National Disability Insurance Scheme. It's an idea I've had the privilege to collaborate on with many others. It is again built upon a simple but powerful idea that all Australians, regardless of impairment or caring for someone with impairment, deserve the same opportunities. Impairment is just one attribute of a person's makeup. Impairment's a fact of life and it can happen to any of us. We understand that. <coughs> but currently in Australian society, we have built a wall around the lives of hundreds of thousands of people with impairment and their carers, and from dawn to dusk, from birth to death, they're living a second-class exile in our own country. And we believe in that simple and powerful idea that impairment does not define your humanity. So thus, we're creating a National Disability Insurance Scheme. We've also introduced Australia's first paid parental leave scheme, a universal scheme, one which the current leader of the opposition said would happen over his dead body. Not every province is kept. Based upon a very simple idea uh, of equality for all women. Then we've got the labour invention of superannuation. Based upon the simple idea that people should retire with dignity. Let's not forget carbon pricing and tackling carbon pollution. Based on the simple idea that our planet is precious. National Broadband Network introduced by our Prime Minister, based on the simple idea that we live in a digital age <coughs> and we should build the infrastructure which allows Australia to exploit the digital age, not be a backwater in the digital age. We've also put work choices in the wheelie bin of history. Unfair dismissal protection for seven million people. That's gotta be a good idea in a good society. The first ever national asbestos strategy first time the Federal Commission will have a remit to deal with the scourge of workplace bullying, all based on simple labour ideas. Let us never forget that what some call the global financial crisis, what others overseas call the global financial recession, we got through in Australia through the efforts of Kevin Rudd and Wayne Swan and Julia Gillard and the 2007 government. 200,000 jobs saved. Nearly a million created since that time to now. Doing okay in the jobs area. Have a look at what though the Liberals believe in. They do not believe in what they say is small touch industrial relations change. So many of their backbench, so many of their thought leaders have said that the pendulum has to swing away from the fair go all round. We will see that if they get elected. <coughs> They are stalling superannuation <coughs> increases. They wish to put a 15% tax on the contributions paid into superannuation 
the three and a half million people earn less than thirty-seven thousand dollars a year, reintroduce a contributions tax on people who don't have much say for their retirement. They seem to have no interest in reducing the size of our carbon footprint. They've belatedly come to a labour light version of better schools, which Christopher Pine called Comsky one day, and a day later was signing up to it. I think they find the idea of change confronting. They would have us believe that Australia cannot compete with the rest of the world and still retain the fair go and the good society. One thing I know is that whatever happens on September the 7th, and when you wake up on September the 8th, happy or not, hungover or not, whoever has one, Clive Palmer, Christine Milne, Barnaby Joyce, <laughs> okay, that would be a surprise. Whatever one, whatever world we wake up to on September the 8th, one thing won't change. One thing will not change, win, lose or draw. Labor will still be the party of ideas in this nation. They say the conservative writers, they say the vested interests, they shout in fact, Labor can't win on September the 7th, it's all over. Give up and go home. It's a lay down mazette. They go further, they cry out that Labor has had its day. The case for Labor can no longer be made. They attack unions as no longer relevant. They say working people have nothing to worry about. They would allege that a good society is a given and it's not earned by each generation through the political system they support. But we know they're wrong. We know that wherever there is a child looking for a good education, whether there is a young adult who cannot find a job or an older adult seeking to rejoin the workforce, wherever there is a family struggling to make ends meet, wherever there is someone going to work who believes in safety at work, wherever you've got families trying to get the best possible education, wherever you've got small businesses struggling against large vested interests, wherever you have people disempowered in Australian society, wherever any of these circumstances exist, then the case for Labor clearly remains. It is difficult with the current noise in the election to necessarily be as optimistic as we hoped we would be. But can I put it to you today that when you survey our history, when you survey what constitutes a good society, when you survey what Labor has added to a good society, when you look at the case for Labor, and when you understand what we stand for, that Labor's best days are yet to come. We wish that we didn't have to fight a difficult election in these circumstances, but we also understand that the work of a progressive movement, a great progressive movement like ours, our work is never done. It can never be done. Think back to what that William Kidston, the Rockhampton bookseller, first Labor treasurer in the world, when he said, the ballot is the thing. The ballot is the thing. They're five simple words which tell us what Labor is all about. Five simple words which tell you how Labor has changed Australia forever for the better. Five simple words which tell you what I'm fighting for, what Andrew Lee's fighting for, what I think we're all fighting for. The fight is ahead of us in this federal election. We've got 11 days to go. Hundreds of conversations for each of us to have with people. 11 days to go where we will hear and have to fight and relitigate the case for Labor. We have 11 days to fight an election which some say is unwinnable. We have a coalition who are hungry for power and hungry to be in charge because they think it's their turn. They see Labor governments as an aberration from the natural order of things. But think about their launch last night. We know that on one side, they have unaffordable and unfair schemes. They're proposing to buy second-hand boats throughout Southeast Asia. They are proposing, on one hand, to say that a pension is worth $19,000 a year, but someone else's child is worth $80,000 a year. How can this be? They are saying that they want to hand back a mining tax to the richest companies in the world. They put a 15% tax on the lowest paid workers in Australia. They are proposing direct action, pumping billions of dollars in an expensive alibi to explain why Tony Abbott shouldn't be convicted 
of not having an interest in climate change. So they propose these programs on one side. But on the other side, they say that there'll be smaller government. They say that they're against the age of entitlement. They say that they don't believe in welfare the same way Labor does. The minimum wage and pay rises for workers, which if they get too high they want to intervene and stop, that's welfare. But a mining tax, a mining company tax refund, the entitlement to $75,000, well that's an entitlement. And that's just the liberal way of things. On one hand they promise much, on the other hand they say government will be smaller. And they slip. They are slippery. A year ago, they'd have the budget in the surplus in a year. More recently, they've said they'll have the budget in the surplus in their first term. Now, they're ambitiously saying we'll have it in the surplus within a decade. They have a philosophy of cutting. And in order to afford their expensive schemes, which are not needed by the Australian people, what will they cut? What jobs will go? What sacrifices will our education system and our healthcare system make to fund their weak philosophy of much smaller government? We can fight tooth and nail. This is a case that can be made. <coughs> One thing, though, is that if we stop fighting now, you can guarantee the outcome. So I, for one, and Andrew Lee, for another, have a view that we will fight this election down to the wire because we are the party of ideas. We know what we've achieved over 122 years. We know what we've achieved over the last nearly six years. We have always been and ever will be engaged in the hardest battle of all, the battle of ideas. We've done it before and we'll do it again. Thank you very much. Bill's got time for a couple of questions, if anyone would, uh, would like to, uh, to throw an interesting question his way. Yes. I've got a question around uh, equality and inequality and people in Java State territory. They are coming under the Commonwealth, they have representation of the but they actually don't have any representation of the state territory. Australians would like to have fewer levels of government. So um, I'll take some of it on notice. I have to say it's not what I turn my mind to directly. Uh, there's no doubt in Australia that we have an interest in a central government, which is necessary, and we've seen the evolution of that over time. But there's also no doubt that there is a need for local government, which is closest to the people in terms of delivering services. And I'm happy to let Andrew supplement that as your representative for Jarvis Bay. <laughs> It's certainly a, uh, a territory with a range of different uh, different challenges, as I always find when I'm there. Uh, the service delivery may well shift from ACT to New South Wales, and they're certainly looking at that. Uh, but as I understand it, it's not a straightforward matter to give Jarvis Bay uh, another tier of government. Uh, for that, they have to make some pretty sweeping changes. In a lot of these debates about um, the part, I mean, you know, which is a party out of ideas or, um, you know, at least like which is a party of liberalism, et cetera, um, it seems that it's only um, the coalition or the like, party that's discussed. Do you think that um, we can uh, ignore the Greens and, you know, not fear that they might capture um, the, you know, you know, diversity in the constituency while we're Oh, you can't ignore the Greens. People vote for them. Um, but you've got to make sure that you can actually do what you say you're going to do. Anyone can make a promise to someone, we know that. But it's how you actually implement the promise becomes relevant. I sometimes feel that uh, Labor is trapped in an Alice in Wonderland political system at the moment where we're the only adults. Where we have to, everything we say has to be costed, but everyone else can offer you whatever and 
So I vote the dog ate their homework or the costumes that come later or we're a new party, not like the old parties, therefore we're not prone to the same disciplines. <coughs> so if you're asking me about, well, you didn't ask me this, but I would just say to you, if you're serious about change, you go with the people with a track record on achieving change. Um, and I also know that when it comes down to uh, implementing a range of ideas rather than a number of single issues, I think Labor does have the uh, runs on the board. I'll just close the door with Yeah, I'll go back and then. Um, in 96, when the Howard came to power, he introduced a raft of IR and reforms. Um, in 98, the war across France occurred. Lack of vision for singers, powers for each road and force. In um, 2004, um, after Said, and in fact, you can buy a book where he likes to the world is from on the basis of what he said. That, uh, work, you know, work choices was the outstanding achievement of the Howard government, that it was bad politics but not bad policy. Um, I don't trust the Conservatives for workplace relations. I've listened to too many of their backbench yell out the abuse, the prejudice which comes to them in those late moments of the evening. Uh, that they think that uh, superannuation has been a union conspiracy but not for profit funds. They say we like good unions but there are no good unions, they would say. Uh, they think penalty rates are what's holding Australia back. You had Eric Abetz briefly pop out of witness protection, briefly <laughs> return <laughs> to where they were keeping him, where he said last week in the Australian, well, we're sick of lazy employers and unions just handing away pay rises. Uh, because, of course, Eric Abetz and the Liberal Party know better the circumstances in enterprises than the people of those enterprises. You've got this bizarre overreach where, uh, on one hand, they've never praised a pay rise that workers have ever got. On the other hand, they're concerned about wages. Real wages have gone up 36% since 1991. That's an achievement of a Labor government. Um, wages in Australia are moving at about 32 to 3.5% annually. This is not a wage system out of control. I'd give more credit to the Liberals' argument on wage restraint if they exercised wage restraint at the top end of town. And they argued, I've never seen a press release come from their industrial relations spokesperson complaining about pay rises unrelated to inflation. Imagine if every corporate leader in Australia only had a pay rise based on inflation. They would complain. They would say, well, we could do better in New York or London. So what am I concerned about? They don't mean what they say. Uh, and what I'm also concerned about is they bitterly resent the role of trade unions in our democracy. And they will uh, certainly um, try and make life hard for the ability of people to enjoy freedom of association. And I'm sure that they will uh, come up with statutory individual arrangements. And I'm sure they'll fund the cases to knock down penalty rates. We're just arguing about weaker penalties. It's, still, it's a classic sort of conservative myth-making proposition. You've got employers who are multi-state employers where they have different penalty rate regimes, different states reflecting different histories. Surely there would have been one employer across states who would have said that because I've got a lower penalty rate in this jurisdiction, I employ more people because allegedly penalty rates are job killers. That evidence is never there. So I worry that these guys aren't interested in the evidence, they're not interested in workers getting a fair, fair increase as negotiated by their unions, and they regard unions as their enemy because unions, by and large, tend to support the Labor Party. Liz Dawson, you had a question? Yes, I'd just like to thank you, Bill. You said some words to me a year or so ago which have really uh, supported me. I'd said that I was not well, and I wanted to build common ground Canberra for low-income and homeless people, and you said, oh, well, we better get our running shoes on. And that was a real help to me. And the federal government has given us $4 million. I'm enormously grateful. And that 
building and the support will go up and we're ready again for next year. So come to the Lord. We serve the Lord, it's nice. Well done, you Liz. Well done, everyone else. It's the gentleman. Uh, Bill, your last statement was that the, what we've achieved in the last six years with the legislation is fantastic. Well, why can't we do a com comparison to what Howard uh, got to in, in his time of power, which was 10 years? Uh, the only thing I can remember that he didn't finish from uh, Keating was the gun control. That's the only thing I can remember. And all the rest of it was Keating's uh, ideas. Yeah, I give Howard government three achievements. The Timor intervention, uh, gun control and the Adelaide Darwin Highway. Yeah. But that's it. Yeah. That's one achievement every three years. Well, you're right. Uh, I look at several baseline indicators. Uh, stock market's up. Yeah, how could that be? Uh, uh, inflation's down. Uh, real wage movements, steady but moderate, not out of control. Thank you. Uh, 77% has spent more on skills and training now than what was spent under our predecessors. Uh, there's, a hundred, there's more kids going to university now than there were, and it's more than just population growth, the number of people going to university, so that's good. We have a disability insurance scheme, the long sites for start. Superannuation after being stalled in the Howard years is moving up. We have $1.6 trillion in savings in our superannuation. You're right. We should do more about comparing and contrasting their record to ours. Yes. Uh, they basically tried to dumb this election down to stopping votes. You know, they basically don't want to talk about anything else. Yeah. And even that now sort of backfired when they want to buy the votes. You might have a go at Tony Jones tonight too. Every every uh, thing that he Q and A when he has it on, you send in a question. You ne you never get it answered. Like you send them, you, you write a question in email. Tweak your heart out. Sorry? <laughs> tweak your heart out. If you don't tweak it, someone else will tweak it. <laughs> yeah, we. <laughs> yeah, well, two questions. You mentioned how we should leave this place in, in a better way for the next generation than it is now. You mentioned, you, have, you stressed it, and you said one sentence on how the science tells us we are heading for disaster. Yeah. Why does Labour not show more backbone? Okay, I've mentioned carbon more than once, but I agree it wasn't uh, the key issue. There were a number of points, but I would submit to you that that's one of the case for Labor. But let me be clear, as a Member of Parliament who sat through the last three years, we paid a big price for taking a stand on carbon pollution. I wish the Greens and the Liberals had voted for an emissions trading system. Mm -hmm. Then Julia Gillard wouldn't have had to be, have hung around her neck the fact that having had to Having one way to acting on carbon pollution was blocked, she chose another way because she was determined to get to the outcome. So there's been a big price paid by Labor, a big price, and not of our making. But we've stuck to our guns and putting a price on carbon pollution. I'm into the art of the possible. If we started with 72 votes in this parliament, have to get a speaker at 71. We've had to get uh, Wilkie, Rob Oakshaw, Tony Windsor, Adam Band. You know, it's been a close run thing. Mm -hmm. So we have, I believe, demonstrated some fortitude. And if the counter, if the counter eye, the counterintuitive to my point about the fortitude we've shown is if we've done such a bad job about fighting for climate change, why does Tony Abbott make at the heart of his campaign a repudiation of what we have done on climate change? So I believe that we have this has been one of the signature fights of this last three years, price on carbon. And I've seen the price, I think, that we've paid electorally for it, but it's been the right proposition to advance. I say also that whilst there are some who say we should go further and faster, they're not in danger of forming a government. Because the people who want to go slower and nowhere are the real enemy. And that's why I would say to people of a persuasion which says we want to see more done, in a beauty parade, it is not two of the same. There is a clear and distinct difference and even if you want to protest by voting for uh, someone who a person believes is more pure, certainly make sure that when you fill in your ballot paper, we're a number higher than the libs. That'll do me, <laughs> and it'll probably do some other people. Thanks, Bill. John Edge. Um, 
Bill, first, thank you very much for your lecture. It's very nicely presented. Also, thank you for your presentation of the press club, um, particularly yeah. the education thing. And what we think of education at the moment, let's look about where would we be now if the education we want could have already been achieved because at the moment we have a wonderful concept of an NBN which is a technological issue. If we had educated our, let's say, um, a couple of special members in the Liberal Party, their argument would be gone because the argument's not political for an NBN, it's a technological argument and it's looking, as you suggested, not two years into the future or three or four, but as far as we can see into the future, fibre optics will be the communication medium. So, uh, Bill, thank you for the uh, thing and I just would like to see um, some effort made to educate the public that technology is not a political issue, it's a fact. We're dealing not with the laws of the nation, we're deal dealing with the laws of physics. Right. And they are unalterable. I would contrast, you know when you see a busy road in one of the big cities, near a bit of freeway, and they build one lane off ramps, that drives me nuts. Because you know it's going to be congested. But that's the equivalent of what they're proposing to do on NBN. If you've got $5,000, you'll plug into it. I don't quite get it. We need to build infrastructure freeways in the digital age. And that's what our NBN is. And you know, I, I always marvel at uh, the debate, which I'd like to go back into time to 1923 when they were debating the width and the size of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. You know, they built an eight lane bridge in 1923 and we're building two lane bridges now. Um, they could take nearly every car in Australia to the fit on the bridge at that time. But they built a bridge for the future, not just the present. I'm sure though there were people who said, uh, this bridge is too wide. Do you really need to use all that steel? Um, just as if you read the Age newspaper of the late 1960s in my hometown of Melbourne, they thundered, the Age thundered. The Tullamarine Airport is too far away from the city and no one will ever use it. Uh, so history does tend to repeat. More broadly on education. You know, the case for labour, if you can't be bothered giving brother or sister-in-law hasn't got the attention span they should have uh, about these issues and they're swinging voters. You can just do seven words. Jobs, education, healthcare, disability, NBN, superannuation, work, workforce. That's um, let's take three more questions and I'm going to take uh, the MC's prerogative to take the last one. So what do we do with these two here and I'll steal one. Um, regardless of the outcome of the election, citizen is allowed to express his views, even if you own 70% of our media. I think some of the Daily Telegraph headlines are so over the top, people always switch off, as I like to joke with Daily Telegraph, well, you know, the, uh, people believe they're even less than us. So you can always overbake your cake. Uh, but it is certainly uh, the complete Americanisation or London Fleet Streetification where uh, of our newspapers, where you see them take a clear partisan position early on and not divert from it no matter what. Our challenge is that there's 15 million <coughs> Australians and we must communicate with at least seven or seven and a half million of them to try and get them interested despite what gets written. But it's a challenge. I'm just wondering, with the Labor Party's change in uh, some policies uh, for what I see as political motivations coming up to this election, such as the PNG solution and bringing the uh, emissions trading scheme in sooner than it was originally going to be implemented, as well as with the uh, political pressure to move towards surplus. 
and not increasing higher education as you have previously. If you spend two terms in opposition as is possible after September the 7th, will we gradually see policy from the Labour Party moving back to an ideological motivation more than a political motivation? I don't think the Labour Party is not ideological or idealistic. I'd submit to you that uh, promoting creation of new industries, investment in new jobs, clean energy technologies, fair rules at work, uh, better superannuation treatment for women. Uh, there's plenty of ideology in this Labor government. Uh, in terms of some of the specifics, higher ed is better funded now than it was when we got here. There are more people going to university than there were. Uh, we're on track to educate even more uni students than we are now. We've put uh, trade training centres back into the picture, over $2 billion expended. The network I've built or being built across 1,000 schools, 375 training centres. So we are a party of education and we've been diligent about promoting it. We are a party of jobs and we've been diligent about promoting fair jobs. We are a party who's interested in lifting people's retirement savings plus disability insurance. So I don't accept that we haven't been highly values-based, motivated government. Like, I've got a cap on payday lenders. No one ever quotes to me. You, you know, you're not ideological enough, but, except for the cap to put on payday lenders. There's been a thousand achievements. Now, whether or not we're good at explaining them all, fair critique. Uh, in terms of an ETS, I don't think that's not ideological. I do believe that uh, market-traded price or carbon pollution is still the best way over time to change behaviours. Uh, we went for a fixed price because we couldn't get the numbers to uh, get it through the Senate. What should Labor have done when we couldn't get a fixed price? Just give up? I don't think so. That would be a betrayal of our supporters. Uh, there's no glory in failure. Uh, what I also know is that when it comes to uh, the issue, the important issue you mentioned about people smuggling, refugees, <coughs> Labor's lifted the number of refugees to a record high that would take 20,000 now. As a country, we have nearly 300,000 babies born, we have 180,000 immigrants come here, we have you know, well over half a million people on visas coming into this country. So we are not anti people coming here. Labor should always jealously guard the debate about being big Australia and pro-immigration. That's certainly the strand of thinking I have. But we should discourage the people smuggling the world. The only solutions are gonna work in regional development, such as the discussions being held with Indonesia. Uh, People are less likely to pay people smugglers a lot of money to get on unsafe boats, potentially drown, if they think they're going to end up in PNG. It's a deterrence. Uh, I don't think it's unhumane to try and discourage mass drownings. But I get that the debate about people arriving here has been contaminated over a decade and a half with the demonisation of people wanting to come here. It is not a crime to want to come to this country. Except for those amongst you who are Indigenous Australians, most of our ancestors came here by boat. In the case of some of mine, it was a free ride. Uh, we just had to wear some chains. So uh, we should never shy away from that. And I think Labor needs to be very clear and upfront about our support for refugees and our support for having people come to this country and the benefits of immigration. But let's face it, you've got criminal syndicates who are seeking to fill up all the places we set aside for refugees. And how do we deter that? If the grand final, be it a league union or a AFL, was to be held, and we knew that in the case of the AFL, 100,000 people would attend and 4,000 going to the match would die on the way to the match, would you cancel the match? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we do about people smugglers when you look at that sort of drought rate? Right? <coughs> so I think we are ideological, but do I think we can always do better? Yes. Do I think there's new fights to have? Yes. Do I think that we uh, need to do a better job in the Labor Party of attracting people to our ranks? Yes. Do we need to break open the structures of decision making in the Labor Party? I think yes. Do we need to become a lot more mass based and reflecting the experiences of a lot of people in our community? Yes. So I'm, it's, don't, please don't interpret my long answer as anything about complacency in how we tackle our fights. There is no big or small fight which is not worth engaging in. So Bill, uh, just as a final question, a lot of the past Fraser lectures have been 
kind of technocratic. They've talked about particular reforms you want to see. Uh, yours at the 13 Fraser Lectures is the most moral. You quote Jesuits, you have this phrase, the good society in the title. It sort of has a feel of the kind of blue labour movement. So I guess my final question for you is, do you think labour can do a better job of capturing the moral language as well as just the technocratic language of, of good policy reform? Moralists make me nervous. Uh, I don't mean to sound too moral because... I have a very basic view that how people wish to live their lives is their business. It really is. It's one of the reasons I voted for marriage equality. Uh, what I do think, though, is that every person's got a right to make choices about the way they live their life. Without a greater form of economic equality, without the sort of propositions I've been advancing, only some Australians will get to choose the way they live. So I think it is possible to explain what we do and why we do it in the context that we've all got a soul, if that's your go, we're all born equal, if that's the particular way you like to express it, but that we, none of us, have necessarily the future that we could have without all of us working together to achieve it. And that's where I think Labor comes in. So you do need technocratic solutions. You do need to have a clear set of values guiding your movement, but fundamentally, Labor's strategy needs to be authentic, it needs to be sincere, it needs to be determined, it needs to be consistent, it needs to be persistent. If we're all those things, sincere, authentic, not cynical, consistent, persistent, determined, people know that when Labor's back in an issue, watch out, it'll get up. You can't always predict when it'll get up. But the reason why our issues will get up is because we speak for the vast chorus of Australians, whose individual voices don't always get heard, but collectively form an assembly or a host whose truth is undeniable. Thanks. Phil, thank you very much.